hypokalemia. Hi again everybody. In our last two installments, we discussed hyperkalemia, its causes, signs and symptoms, and treatment. In this segment, we will talk about the opposite electrolyte disturbance, hypokalemia. First, let's go over some background information on potassium. Let's quickly review some highlights as presented in the previous lectures on hyperkalemia. Some basic facts about potassium. The normal potassium concentration in the serum is maintained within a narrow range of 3.5 to 5 MEQs per liter. Potassium is a major intracellular cation. Roughly 98% of total body potassium exists inside the cell, predominantly in muscle cells. In the intracellular fluid inside the cell, the normal potassium concentration is 140 to 150 MEQs per liter. The sodium potassium pump actively transports sodium and potassium across the cell membrane and maintains this gradient. Only 2% is found in the extracellular compartment, intravascular and interstitial spaces. Let's go over some of the physiology of potassium. Potassium plays a major role in transmitting and conducting nerve impulses, including contractions of cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscles. Potassium is required for neuromuscular excitability, primarily by maintaining the electric resting and action potential of the cell membrane. Potassium balance in the body is maintained predominantly by regulation of renal excretion. The adrenal gland and the pancreas, insulin, also play significant roles. Approximately 90% of the ingested potassium is eliminated by the kidneys and approximately 10% is eliminated via the GI tract. Now let's move on and begin our discussion on hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is generally defined as a serum potassium level of less than 3.5 MEQs per liter. The majority of hypokalemic patients are classified as mild with serum potassium concentrations between 3 and 3.5 MEQs per liter. As many as one quarter of these patients have values below 3 MEQs per liter. Severe hypokalemia is defined as having a potassium level less than 2.5 MEQs per liter. Hypokalemia is usually well tolerated in otherwise healthy individuals, but it can be life-threatening when severe, especially in the elderly and those with comorbidities. Let's go over the causes of hypokalemia. The cause of hypokalemia is usually apparent from the history and physical examination. Hypokalemia may result from inadequate potassium intake, a shift of potassium from the extracellular to the intracellular space, or increased potassium excretion. Hypokalemia due to poor or decreased intake of potassium is rare. Hypokalemia due to an intracellular shift of potassium by itself is a distinctly uncommon cause. Increased potassium excretion is the most common mechanism of hypokalemia. Increased potassium excretion is most commonly due to the following mechanisms. Increased GI losses, drugs, and polyurea. Let's first talk about increased GI losses. Severe gastrointestinal losses from diarrhea, prolonged vomiting, or nasogastric suctioning can lead to hypokalemia. Gastric fluid itself contains little potassium, approximately 10 MEQs per liter. However, vomiting produces volume depletion and metabolic alkalosis, which are accompanied by increased renal potassium excretion. This occurs as a result of activation of the RAS system. Volume depletion activates the RAS system, which leads to an increase in aldosterone secretion which in turn causes enhanced renal secretion of potassium in exchange for enhanced sodium reabsorption. Metabolic alkalosis also ensues due to the loss of hydrogen ions in response to sodium reabsorption. There are three key drugs that cause hypokalemia. One are diuretics, two steroids, and three amphotericin B. 
Diuretics. The most common cause of hypokalemia is the use of diuretics. Both diazide and loop diuretics block chloride-associated sodium reabsorption. As a result, there is an increased delivery of sodium to the collecting tubules. This creates a favorable electrochemical gradient in exchange for potassium secretion. The degree of hypokalemia is directly related to the dose of the thiazide diuretic and is greater when dietary sodium intake is higher. The combined use of furosemide or bumetanide with metolazone invariably causes moderate to severe hypokalemia despite potassium supplementation. Steroids. Glucocorticoids such as prednisone and hydrocortisone can mimic the effects of aldosterone in the kidney, leading to potassium excretion. Enhanced sodium reabsorption at the distal tubule and collecting ducts is exchanged for potassium and hydrogen ion secretion. At the end of the RAS system, aldosterone has its effects on retaining sodium and eliminating potassium and hydrogen ion. This diagram shows glucocorticoids such as prednisone mimicking the effect of aldosterone and creating the same effect on potassium, leading to hypokalemia. Glyceryzic acid contained in licorice and some Chinese herbal preparations can also cause hypokalemia. It inhibits 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. This enzyme normally converts active cortisol into inactive cortisone. Active cortisol is normally converted to inactive cortisone via the enzyme 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Glyceryzic acid inhibits this enzyme, causing an increased level of active cortisol, leading to enhanced steroid effects, including hypokalemia. Amphotericin B. Amphotericin B causes renal potassium wasting through the inhibition of the secretion of hydrogen ions by collecting duct cells, as well as by causing magnesium depletion. The third cause of increased potassium excretion is polyuria. In polyuria, potassium can be depleted through the kidneys by increased urine flow, such as with osmotic diuresis from high urine glucose levels. Other causes of hypokalemia include magnesium depletion. Magnesium depletion impairs the activity of the cell membrane sodium-potassium ATPase, resulting in a reduced intracellular potassium concentration and eventual renal potassium wasting. There are two types of hyperaldosteronism that can cause hypokalemia. One is primary hyperaldosteronism, which is most commonly from an adrenal adenoma or bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. Secondary hyperaldosteronism caused from volume depletion, congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, or vomiting. Another cause for hypokalemia is renal tubular acidosis. And other drugs that can cause hypokalemia include laxatives and enemas. Large doses of laxatives cause excessive potassium loss in the stool. The signs and symptoms of hypokalemia are nonspecific and are predominantly related to muscular or cardiac function. Complaints may include the following. Weakness and fatigue, which is the most common symptom. Muscle cramps and pain in severe cases. Worsening diabetes control or polyuria. Palpitations and psychological symptoms such as psychosis and delirium. With a potassium level between 3 and 3.5, the patient is usually asymptomatic. They may complain of malaise, weakness, fatigue, and myalgia. When the potassium level reaches less than 2.5, leg cramps, restless leg syndrome, and paresthesias can occur. This is because potassium is necessary for vasodilation in skeletal muscle. When the potassium reaches less than 2.0, ascending paralysis can develop with eventual impairment of respiratory function. Rhabdomyolysis can ensue. Severe hypokalemia may manifest as bradycardia 
with cardiovascular collapse. Cardiac arrhythmias and acute respiratory failure from muscle paralysis are life-threatening complications that require immediate intervention. Hypokalemia can lead to hyperpolarization of myocardial cells and a prolonged refractory period. When serum potassium concentrations fall below 3, T wave flattening, ST segment depression, and prominent U waves are seen on the ECG. You can see here the ST depression that occurs on the ECG with hypokalemia and the development of a prominent U wave. Any of the following ECG findings may occur. When we treat hypokalemia, we need to ask ourselves if we want to supplement the potassium either orally or intravenously. Potassium can be replenished either orally or intravenously. If the patient can take medications orally, Oral potassium replacement is usually the preferred route. Intravenous potassium replacement is necessary either when the patient cannot take oral medications or when the potassium deficit is very severe and is acutely causing life-threatening symptoms. Oral potassium. Patients who have mild or moderate hypokalemia, potassium level of 2.5 to 3.5, are usually asymptomatic. If these patients have only minor symptoms, they may only need oral potassium replacement therapy. Oral potassium is absorbed readily and relatively large doses can be given safely. Oral administration is limited by patient tolerance because some individuals develop nausea or even gastrointestinal irritation. There is no simple way to calculate the amount of potassium needed for a patient. Typically, 10 to 40 MEQs of supplemental potassium chloride is needed daily to maintain serum potassium concentrations near or within the normal range in patients receiving diuretics. One should always err on the low end of this estimate to avoid inducing hyperkalemia. In the occasional patient with severe symptoms or marked hypokalemia with ECG changes, potassium must be given more rapidly. This can be quickly and easily done with oral administration, as the plasma potassium concentration will approximately rise by 1 MEQ per liter after 40 MEQs of oral potassium chloride solution is administered. Oral potassium is safer because potassium enters the circulation more slowly. Oral potassium chloride can be given in either tablet, liquid, or powder form. The most popular tablet form of potassium chloride is the extended release tablet, also known as KDOR, which is available in 10 or 20 MEQ strengths. Liquid potassium chloride is available as a 10% oral solution with a concentration of 20 MEQs per 15 ml. Potassium chloride is also available in powder form which can be prepared with water to make an oral solution. Let's move on and talk a little bit about giving potassium via IV piggyback. If cardiac arrhythmias or significant symptoms are present, more aggressive therapy is warranted. This is exemplified by the ECG that we've shown earlier. If the potassium level is less than 2.5 MEQs per liter, Intravenous or IV potassium should be given. Maintain close follow-up care, provide continuous ECG monitoring, and check serial potassium levels. Regarding the potassium IV infusion rate, it's important to remember that too rapid administration of potassium is potentially dangerous, even in severely hypokalemic patients. A rate in excess of 10 MEQs per hour can result in the electrocardiographic changes of hyperkalemia or complete heart block. When giving potassium as supplemental IV piggyback riders, the most common infusion rate is 5 to 10 MEQs per hour. Now we'll talk about the potassium concentration first in peripheral lines. For large volume perennial solutions of 1000 mLs, 
Potassium is usually added in a concentration of 20 to 40 MEQs per liter. In general, no more than 60 MEQs per liter should be given through a peripheral vein, since higher concentrations of potassium are very irritating, resulting in pain and sclerosis of the vein. Smaller piggyback riders of supplemental potassium chloride for peripheral veins should have an approximate concentration of 10 MEQs per 100 ml. For example, in order to replenish 40 MEQs of KCL through a peripheral vein, 40 MEQs of KCL should be placed in 500 ml of D5W or NS. What should the potassium concentration be for central lines? For central line administration, potassium can be highly concentrated as the rapid blood flow quickly dilutes the IV solution that is administered. Smaller piggyback riders of supplemental potassium chloride for central veins usually has a maximum concentration of 20 MEQs per 50 ml. For example, in order to replenish 40 MEQs of KCL through a central line, two bags of 20 MEQs per 50 ml can be administered over four hours. These bags should be clearly marked administration only via central line to avoid any serious errors. To review, the maximum infusion rate for potassium chloride for either a peripheral line or central line is 10 MEQs per hour. The maximum concentration of KCL for large volume perennial solutions for either a peripheral line or central line should be limited to 10 MEQs per 100 ml with a maximum of 60 MEQs per liter. For example, a solution of D5 half an S plus 20 MEQs of KCL in a 1000 ml bag. The maximum concentration for potassium rider supplements is different between a peripheral line and a central line. For a peripheral line, we should limit the concentration to 10 MEQs per 100 ml. For example, KCL 40 MEQs in 500 mLs of D5W over 4 hours would be appropriate. However, for a central line, it is rapidly diluted by the blood flow, and so the limit on that is much more concentrated, 20 MEQs for 50 ml. So we can give 20 MEQs of KCL in 50, 20 MEQs of KCL in 50 ml D5W over two hours. Exception to the potassium rate limit. An exception to the potassium 10 MEQs per hour rate limit rule can be applied under the following conditions. A KCL infusion rate of 15 to 20 MEQs per hour may be considered if all of the following apply. The patient's potassium level must be below 2.5 MEQs per liter. They must show life-threatening arrhythmias that are present on the ECG. And the patient has to have a cardiac monitor and is in an intensive care unit. Finally, in the treatment of hypokalemia, we need to address the underlying cause. Nearly all disorders characterized by potassium loss are accompanied by loss of other components of body fluids, including sodium, chloride, water, bicarbonate, or acid. Therefore, it is critical to identify the cause of the potassium depletion and to correct it as soon as possible. In summary, we reviewed the physiology of potassium in the body and how it is regulated we listed the three main causes of hypokalemia. We named three drugs that can cause hypokalemia and explained their mechanisms. We listed two ECG changes that are observed with progressive worsening hypokalemia. We stated the three different oral potassium dosage forms, and we outlined the maximum rate and concentration for the use of intravenous potassium for peripheral and for central lines. We've got a lot in store at the Farm Easy Tutor channel. There will be upcoming talks on anticoagulation featuring warfarin, heparin, and the DOAX. Electrolyte management, quinolone side effects, all about hospital pharmacy, and much, much more. So please stay tuned to us. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the Farm Easy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. 
Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.